everybody. Happy Mother's Day. Uh, really cool to see some of those little ones already opening the Word, so we pray that that continues in their life and that they continue to seek the Lord. Would we uh, seek the Lord in prayer just one more time before we dive into our passage this morning? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this opportunity to open your Word, uh, to continue our study in 1 John chapter 4. I pray that your Holy Spirit would meet us in this moment and help illuminate your word so that we might understand it and live in light of it. We thank you for all the families today dedicating their young children. We just ask your blessings over them and we ask your blessings over all uh, the women in the room. And we just thank you for them and thank you for the gift of life, Lord. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so, excuse me. Uh, we are diving into 1 John 4 and it's fun. Uh, this morning has been very fun, very exciting. And our passage today is going to deal with false teachers. So buckle up, it's going to be fun and, uh, and roll. But I love the phrase that says, not everything that glitters is gold. It's kind of the idea that not everything that looks good is actually good for you. Uh, maybe you've heard the term fool's gold. And you can read all these stories of these uh, treasure hunters and explorers who would find what they thought was gold and they would load their ships up with hundreds of pounds of what they thought was their new fortune and their new lot in life only to return home to find out that they had only discovered fool's gold. It was just a mineral in a rock that looked like gold. It had the appearance of gold, but sadly was not the true treasure that they thought it was. I bring this up because since Genesis 3, humanity has found themselves in a war that is going on. It is a war between the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan, and this has been going on for a long time. And it, in the, the Christian world, we use the term spiritual warfare to describe this battle. And this is a battle that we all find ourselves in. Satan and his demonic forces, their, their goal in this life is to kill, steal, and destroy. A simple way of thinking about it is they are trying to take as many people with them to hell as possible. That is the enemy. That is his goal. And we all know that when you find yourself in a war, you use different war tactics, different uh, measures and skills, and you look for opportunities to take down your enemy. And I believe one tactic that the enemy uses is he uses this kind of spiritual fool's gold uh, to confuse people. It's called false teaching. The enemy sends out false teachers and false prophets to spread lies and religious misinformation with the goal to deceive people. They disguise themselves as teachers of the truth and they'll, they'll teach so close to the biblical truth that sometimes it's hard to spot them out, but their goal is to deceive people and lead them astray. Their teachings are false, they're not biblical, and they are seeking to lead people away from Jesus and undermine the work of the church. And just as Fool's Gold has fooled so many different people over the years, Satan has been using false teachers and false doctrine to lead people astray, and he is still actively doing that today. So as we turn to 1 John chapter 4, John is super concerned for these believers that he's writing to, and he wants them to be able to see false teaching, call it out, and discern between truth and error. He wants the believers to know that this is a serious issue. It could be a matter of life and death the true gospel versus a false gospel. And I believe for us here today, this is just as relevant as ever. Today, now more than ever, false teachers have easier access to you than they have in previous generations. Through things like social media and Amazon, you can order the book of a prominent false teacher straight to your doorstep and have it there by the end of the day. Or you can be on Instagram and find these uh, Instagram or TikTok theologians who are teaching false doctrine to you with the goal of deceiving you. Uh, my wife and I and our son were at the library the other day and I found myself in the religious section and I was like, ah, let me, let me see what they have. Maybe I can save some money and rent out some books. And as I'm looking down the list of authors that are on the shelf, I'm like, that is a false teacher, false teacher. They teach heresy and just going down the list. False teachers are everywhere, and John is concerned with you and I knowing how to mark them out and to avoid them. So we're going to read our passage today. We want to be equipped to tell if a teaching is from God or from Satan. Heavy, I know, but this is vital for all of our spiritual health. And we'll see throughout the New Testament that false prophets are talked about, called out, uh, said like this is what they are and you should avoid them and we're going to look at that uh, this morning. So let's read 1 John 1 through 6. 
John starts by saying, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits to see whether they are from God. For many false prophets have gone out into the world. By this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not from God. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. Little children, you are from God and have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. They are from the world, therefore they speak from the world, and the world listens to them. We are from God. Whoever, God, whoever knows God listens to us. Whoever is not from God does not listen to us. By this we know the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. So the first thing I want to point out to you from the first three verses is that we must test the spirits. John starts in verse 1 by saying, beloved. And he's using that term as an all-encompassing term to address the whole church. He's not just writing to the pastors, elders, or theologians in the church, but he's writing to the whole body, and that means what he's about to say is for everybody in the church to do, not just those who have some systematic theologies on their bookshelf or, or who really like going deep into theology, but it's for all of us to follow his command. So what does he say to us? He tells us to not believe every spirit, but to test the spirits. To test the spirits carries the idea of examining the content of the message to figure out what its origin is. You say, what do you mean by that? What am I examining for? What do you mean by that? What you're trying to do when you test the spirits is see, is this teaching from God or from the enemy? Behind every sermon, every podcast, every book, every song, every teaching, there is a spirit. And John is clear that that spirit is either the spirit of truth, which comes from the Holy Spirit, or the spirit of error, which comes from the enemy, Satan. And so John is warning the Christians against automatically believing everything that you hear in church just because uh, it sounds good or you're sitting in a church pew. Or just because the person claims to be a teacher of the truth does not mean that they're teaching the truth. A false prophet is one who claims to have a divine message but speaks falsehood. A false prophet is one who denies or distorts the teachings of the Bible. And here's the thing about false teachers. They almost never start their books or their sermons by saying, hey, I'm a false teacher and I'm going to try to deceive you in the next few moments. They never do that. They are strategic. They are crafty. Jesus says in Matthew 7, beware of the false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are ravenous wolves. False prophets will try to look like Christians or teachers of the truth, but their true goal, their true goal is self-deception and their gain in this life. They are like wolves seeking to devour. Second Peter 2 says this, but false prophets arose among the people, that is the people of Israel, but just as there will be, uh, just as there will be false prophets among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who bought them, bringing upon themselves swift judgments. And many will follow their sensuality, and because of them, the way of the truth will be blasphemed. And in their great greed, they will exploit you with their false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. False prophets are present, and they are dangerous. So John says we must test the spirits, and you might be sitting here. Great, good. How do we do that? I want to offer four ways that you can do this, two from the Old Testament and then two from our passage today. When you look at the Old Testament in the book of Deuteronomy, there are two tests given to uh, see if a person is a false prophet or not, to test the spirit behind a teaching. The first one is, does the prophecy come true? Does the prophecy come true? Deuteronomy 18, 21 and 22 says, if any, and if you say in your heart, how may we know that the Lord has not spoken? So how do we know that this is not from the Lord? Verse 22, when a prophet speaks in the name of the Lord, if the Lord does not come, or if the word does not come to pass or come true, that is a word from the Lord that has not been spoken. The prophet has spoken presumptuously, you need not be afraid of him. So he's saying, the Lord is saying here in this passage, if someone prophesies, if they make a claim and it does not come true, then that means that person did not speak for the Lord. Uh, we saw this in COVID. There were a lot of very popular teachers who made prophecies at the beginning of the pandemic. Uh, they said things like, the Lord told me that this is going to end in a couple of weeks and no more than 5,000 people are going to die. 
Well, we know from uh, what happened that that's not true. They proved themselves to be a false teacher uh, or not speaking politically in any way, but there were many people who went to Facebook and, and during some of the turmoil and the, uh, the election and some of the controversy, some men got on Facebook and they were like, I'm predicting that in the next coming weeks, President Trump will regain his pre presidency. That didn't happen. So therefore, they are a false teacher. They've proven themselves to say they're speaking on behalf of God, but they lie because it did not happen. It did not take place. I was on Instagram the other day and uh, just scrolling through reels, probably not a great place to spend a lot of your time, but I, I get this really just stupid reel. It's the best way to describe it. But this man gets on there and he's like, the Lord told me that your financial breakthrough is coming this month. So all you have to do to claim it is comment down below, I claim it. So I go to the comments and I type by click. No, just kidding. Uh, but I go, I go to the comments and thousands of people are typing. I claim it. I claim it. I claim it. I claim it. And that man, whether he realizes it or not, if that financial breakthrough does not come through for all those thousands of people, he has labeled and marked himself as a false prophet because he claimed to speak on behalf of God and it did not come through true. So first, you see, is what they're saying, is what they're teaching, does it come true? The second one, does the prophet point you away from God? Does the prophet point you away from God? Deuteronomy 13, 1 through 4 says, if a prophet or a dreamer of dreams arises among you and gives you a sign or a wonder, and the sign or wonder that he tells you comes to pass, and he says, let us go after other gods, which you have not known, and he says, let us serve them, you shall not listen to the words of that prophet or the dreamer of dreams. For the Lord your God is testing you to know whether you love the Lord with all your heart and with all your soul. I think that passage is very interesting because you notice he doesn't deny that, that signs and wonders can come from another source. He says, if someone comes to you and they perform signs and wonders, but they point you away from the Lord, that they are not from the Lord, that they are not teaching from the Lord, that they are not operating out of the power of the Holy Spirit, but from uh, some other source. One writer says, Christians need to be reminded that spiritual activity is not necessarily godly activity. You can think of Acts chapter 8, when there's the magician in the town who's performing all these signs and wonders and miracles, and he's gaining this following, and then he tries to purchase the power of the Holy Spirit because he realizes it's something that he does not have. He was operating out of some source of power that did not come from the Lord. And so the Lord and, and Scripture is telling us to test every spirit. And see, do they point you to the Lord or do they point you to someone else, like, say, Joseph Smith or something along those lines? Then John adds a third test in verses 2 and 3. He says, does the teacher confess and believe in Jesus Christ and his incarnation? That's the third test. Does the teacher confess and believe in Jesus Christ and his incarnation? He says in verses 2 and 3, uh, by this you know the Spirit of God. Every spirit that confesses Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is from God. And every spirit that does not confess Jesus is from God, uh, does not come from God, sorry. This is the spirit of the Antichrist, which you have heard was coming and now is in the world already. So in John's context, there were these false teachers that were attacking the church. Some people uh, speculate or wonder which uh, old heresy that it was, but it's clear that the heresy denied Jesus' incarnation, meaning that Jesus put on flesh and became man. Uh, they denied the death and resurrection of Jesus and other essential truths of Christianity. So John wants his church here to be able to spot these false teachers for what they are, call them out and reject them. He does not want his body, these Christians, the church of Christ, to follow these false teachers. So he's saying, do they confess the biblical Christ? This test is a matter of do they believe and confess the biblical teaching of the incarnation of Christ? So what this means is that Jesus was fully God in heaven and came down from heaven to earth and put on human flesh. But in his incarnation, in his putting on of flesh, Jesus never sacrificed his deity. He still remained fully God while also becoming fully man. It's what theologians would call the God-man, or other ways to say it would be Jesus throughout his earthly ministry was 100% God and 100% man. He never offered up his divinity and he never was like the appearance of a man but not actually a man. That is the incarnation of Christ. And so John is saying that if someone denies that, if they don't affirm that, if they teach something other than that, then they are a false 
teacher. He's helping his audience know how to see the heresy of their day, to call it out and to run from it and deny it because it does not give the life-giving message of the gospel, lead to the life-giving message of the gospel. Another way to think of that uh, sermon, or, or sorry, that question is, does this teacher that you're listening to preach the biblical Jesus? Because false teachers and false religions often will mention Jesus, but that does not mean that they are teaching Jesus. Islam talks about Jesus, but it is not the biblical Jesus. Mormonism talks about Jesus, but it is not the biblical Jesus. Jehovah Witnesses talk about Jesus, but it is not the biblical Jesus. The Health, Wealth, and Prosperity Crew talks about Jesus, but it is not the biblical Jesus. Just because they mention Jesus does not mean it is the biblical Jesus. We have to understand that. We have to know that and be able to see that. And I think there's a fourth test that we can add in that is an all-encompassing test for us. Does the teacher contradict or add to the word of God? Is this teacher truly teaching what the Bible teaches? Because false teachers will often twist or manipulate God's word, adding things to it or taking things away to serve their agenda. For false teachers, the Bible is their tool to deceive you and to lead into their teachings. It's like a, a stepping stone into their false teachings, if you will. Uh, you can look at the Jehovah Witnesses and their version of the Bible that they put out and see that they've added words into that. Or you can look at the Book of Mormon and they've, they've added to the canon of Scripture through the Book of Mormon. They've added something to it. Or other false teachers will, will preach from the New Testament or the Old Testament, but they will twist the Scriptures to make it say something that God never intended for it to say. As Christians, we test every spirit according to the Word of God. God's word is our foundation and our lens through which we view the world and interpret truth. We do not go outside of God's word when it comes to finding out what is true, what is good, and what is profitable for us. 2 Timothy 3 says all scripture is breathed out by God, meaning it all comes directly from him. It is perfect, infallible, and always true. And it says it's profitable for teaching or you could say doctrine for reproof, for correction, for the uh, correction of your own life or the false teachings of others and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So you might say, well, well, how could I tell that something like Mormonism is wrong? How could I tell that that's a, a false teaching? Well, you look at what they teach and you compare it to God's word. They teach that Jesus was created. That's a major heresy that Christians have been fighting for thousands of years. They teach that there was a, a heavenly mother and a heretical view of the Trinity. Sadly, it is a false doctrine that leads people astray. We can look at Islam and, and see that they deny the deity of Jesus. If you deny the deity of Jesus, there is no salvation present. We can look at other religions and we can see the falsehoods, but John would also have us examine what is taught in the church. To, to, to listen to what is taught from the pulpits in our churches and to make sure that it aligns with the word of God. In Jude verse 3, it says that false teachers have crept into the church. They, they creep in often unnoticed with their false teachings. Uh, 2 Corinthians 11, 13 through 15. This is Paul writing. He says, for such men are false prophets, deceitful workmen, disguising themselves as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for even Satan disguises himself as an angel of light. So it is no surprise that if, uh, if his servants also disguise themselves as servants of righteousness, but their end will correspond to their deeds. It is clear that false teachers have a goal of trying to infiltrate the church teach their false doctrine, and make the church uh, useless because we deny the gospel or lay aside God's word and teach and follow after these false doctrines. But I think, I spent some time on a Bible college campus, around seminary students, I, I, I did that for years. I think it's important to note the difference between a, a, just a bad teacher or confused Christian and a false teacher because there is a difference. There's a, there's a wide difference between the two. A bad teacher, it's just maybe a pastor or a teacher who, who doesn't teach the word well. Maybe they don't know how to study the word or, or maybe they just interpret things wrong. But, but they're not necessarily teaching false doctrine. They're just not a good preacher and you shouldn't listen to them. So there's that person. Then there's the, the confused Christian. 
The, the person who knows the gospel, believes the gospel, is all good on that. But they're confused on some other matter, right? They're, they just get it wrong somewhere else. And so it wouldn't be right for you to be in your life group or your small group and, and you know, someone teaches something false and you pull them aside afterwards and like, how long have you been serving the, the, the enemy, right? Like, like, how long have you been a... That's, that's not a false teacher. And I just want to be careful about not calling a bad teacher a false teacher because to label someone a heretic is a serious thing. And so we should be careful about that. But then there's the false teachers who are over here with the whole goal of deceiving people. The whole goal of leading people away from Jesus and undermining the church. And those men and those women deserve the title and should be labeled like that. Should be called out and should be pushed to the side and not welcomed in churches because they are sent from Satan to destroy the church. Uh, one author would say this. Heretical teaching is nothing more or nothing less than a satanic attempt to get people to believe a lie. He would go on to say that false teachers are a mouthpiece of Satan. So we want to be careful to not flippantly label a brother or sister a false teacher, because that's dangerous, and you might bring God's judgment on you if you do that, but we also want to make sure that someone who's speaking for Satan, that we call them what they are, right? Do we understand that? Does that make sense? I hope it does. I hope it does. We should be careful to test the spirits. If you look at the end of verse 3, he says to test everything according to God's word, because the spirit of the Antichrist is already in the world. The New Testament makes it clear that these false teachers are already present. They've been around for thousands of years doing this work, trying to destroy the church. They're here. That's why we test the spirits. Because those men and women are out in the world, sent out, so we test the spirits. We must know our faith, know the word, so we can test the spirits and understand that not everything spiritual is from the Holy Spirit. Not everything that glitters is gold. But let's move to point two. Point two, so uh, we have overcome the evil one. That's what I want to point out. We have overcome the evil one. Excuse me. So maybe there's part of you that is a little fearful, right? Maybe you haven't heard teachings like this. You're like, geez, like, is Satan after me right now? Well, yes. But I want to encourage you with the truth because our strength in this battle does not come from us. Because, yes, Satan is powerful. Yes, he has demonic forces. Yes, he sends out false prophets. But John says this in verse 4. He says, little children, you are from God, and you have overcome them. For he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. There is victory in this battle because the one who is inside of us is greater than the one who is in the world. You say, who is the one in the world? He's talking about Satan. He's talking about the enemy. And the one inside of us is the Holy Spirit. All who are Christian are indwelt by the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit is just as much God as the Son and the Father. He's existed for all of eternity, was present at creation, and will reign forever and ever in the Holy Spirit. That one part of the Godhead lives inside of you and I. So our power over Satan, the demonic forces, and everything else, it doesn't come from our strength and wisdom, but it comes from the resurrection of Christ and his uh, defeating of the, the powers that be, and then our continual ability to crush the enemy, to push back darkness, to fight against Satan's kingdom comes from the Holy Spirit inside of us. So we need not be afraid because the one who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. Amen? That's a truth that we can hold on to and cling to. But our text goes on, and it wants to help us understand the difference between Christians and those of the world. I love a good origin story, okay? I, I love origin stories, especially superheroes like Spider-Man. I mean, there's not really a better origin story than Spider-Man. Bit by a radioactive spider, gets all these superpowers. It's the best, right? I love stories of, you hear, you know, there were these athletes who grew up underprivileged and not supported, but because of their hard work and their success, they, as you would say, got it out of the mud and made something of themselves and became an Olympic athlete or a world champion. I love stories like that. Or How many of you have watched Shark Tank before, the, the show that everybody watches in the hotel room because there's, <laughs> there's nothing else to watch? I love watching those, and you see these young aspiring entrepreneurs who they, they pitch their idea and then you fast forward 10 years later and you see they built this multi-million or billion dollar uh, business from what they did. I love origin stories. And in verse 5 and 6, we're going to see the difference between Christians and false prophets. It's a matter of origin. 
He says that we are from God, meaning we are his children. We have been saved and born again. We have been indwelt by the Holy Spirit. Therefore, we speak God's truth. The false teachers, sadly, have not been saved by God. They are from the world, so they speak from the world, as John says. And the saddest part that he says is that the world listens to them. I sometimes sit back and I find myself wondering, how have these false teachers, these men and women who are preying on people, taking advantage of people, how have they built such a large platform? Why do they have millions of people all around the world that are following them? Well, I look at this passage and I remember that false teachers speak a message that is attractive to lost people. Like the health, wealth, and prosperity crew gain such a large following because people want health, wealth, and prosperity. One commentator says the world listens to those who speak its own language. And so we see these false prophets, they, they gain these large followings because they speak a message that is popular. Christians come with the message of the gospel, which is oftentimes offensive and off-putting to lost people, while false teachers will tickle the ears of their believers, telling them what they want to hear. 2 Timothy 4, 3 says, For a time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but have, having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. That is why false teachers seemingly have such an easy time reaching large audiences, because lost people seek what they desire in their teachers. They, they seek out these people, and these false teachers prey on them and lead them astray. But even still, John encourages us to remember that we are God's children. Though the world rejected Jesus and the world rejects us, we carry on knowing that the victory has been won for us and that we are indwelt by the Holy Spirit, equipped for every good work that we need to do by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so as we, we begin to kind of, uh, I'll say this for my students, because I say, I say this all the time, we'll land the plane here in the, these next couple minutes. But I want to be practical, because I don't want to just say all of this, and, and I, I don't know if it'd be super helpful if I just went through all the people that I thought were false teachers, because there's so many, and, and I could get it wrong. But I read this article by a man named Tim Challies. He's an he's a author, writer, YouTuber does lots of good things, and his article was basically the seven kinds of false teachers that we see in the modern day church. And so I hope to give these to you, for you to write them down, take them home, and then you, by the power of the Holy Spirit, can be equipped to discern and test the spirits on your own. But I do want to be clear, I can send you this article, but much of what I'm going to say is just taken right from him. So all credit to him. These are mostly not my words in this section right here, okay? Uh, so the first one that he mentions is the heretic. This is the person who teaches what blatantly contradicts an essential teaching of the Christian faith. They sometimes contradict a truth taught in scripture by either just not teaching it, taking it away, or adding something to scripture. So this is someone who teaches heresy, an unbiblical view on an essential truth of Christianity, like the gospel, like the deity of Jesus, like the Trinity. They take an essential truth and they twist it, they manipulate it, and it turn it into a false teaching. Then there's the, the charlatan. This is the one who uses Christianity as a means of personal enrichment. They use people as a tool for their personal gain, right? Their teachings often at the root of it have their own personal bank account. They are fleecing the flock and growing their audience for their own good. This would be like the, the health, wealth, and prosperity group, the, the kind of live your life now or live your best life now attitude or the, the so 10, get 100. You give 10% to me and God's going to give you a hundredfold back. The, the kind of teaching that has taken millions, if not billions of dollars from, from non-suspecting people. Uh, so there's a charlatan. Then there's the prophet. This is the person who claims to be gifted by God to speak fresh, new revelation that goes outside of scripture. They package it as a new authoritative word of prediction or teaching or rebuke or encouragement, but they don't function from the spiritual gifts, but they lie and manipulate. Think Book of Mormon or something like that. It's a, it's a new prophet who's speaking a new word that goes outside of scripture. Then there's the abuser. This person uses his position of leadership to take advantage of other people. They claim to be tending and caring for the flock, but they really just care about hurting people and using people to gain from them. So there's the abuser. 
Then there's the divider, the the person who uses false teaching to disrupt and destroy the church. We see this in many denominations today that are fractioning and, and breaking apart because false teaching has been brought into the church to remove the gospel and make the church useless. So the divider is trying to get inside of churches and denominations and, 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 and boards, and he's trying to teach false doctrine to divide the church because if the church is fighting each other, then we're not focused on our mission of taking the gospel to the lost, and then the divider has done what he seeks to do. Get them to fight inside so they never go outside and share the gospel. Then there's a, this guy, might not sound as dangerous, but the tickler, uh, just as dangerous and just as bad. But he's a false teacher who cares nothing for what God wants and everything for what people want. They, uh, they might teach only prosperity but never sin or only heaven but never hell. They only preach what people want to hear, not what the word of God teaches. They're like the, the Second Timothy 4, 3 kind of preacher, just teaching what people want to hear. Then there's the speculator. This is the person who speculates with novelty or originality. Instead of focusing on God's word and, and teaching God's word, they'll focus on predicting, predicting an election or some obscure end time prophecy. And they only talk about these new things, these, these random things that don't matter. And they, they toss aside the bulk of the Bible's content and weight and emphasize things that really don't matter to lead people astray and to distract from the gospel. So you could take that uh, list, courtesy of Tim Challies, and, and use that to test the spirits, to equip yourself to see what is right and see what is wrong. I believe, as, as we end this morning, that those who are uninformed or stagnant spiritually are those who are most in danger of one of these false teachers. False teachers often will attack and, and go after those who have strayed from the pack. And what I mean by that is if you are outside of Christian community, if you don't have brothers and sisters speaking into your life, if you're not actively involved in a church or surrounded by people that are grounded in the word, you are one of the most like opportune people for a false teacher to come along and and sweep away into their false teachings. I believe God's given us the church for so many reasons, but one great reason is the community and the shepherding that it provides, that you would be surrounded by other brothers and sisters who are kind of shoulder to shoulder, locked arms with you, shield to shield, guarding each other from sin, from false teachings, from the ways of the world, and we would all protect ourselves and stand strong together, going into battle arm in arm, shoulder in shoulder, shield to shield, looking at the false teaching, calling it out, looking at sin, calling it out, looking at the ways of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, calling it out and helping each other grow in Christ-likeness. We have the church for so many reasons, but I believe that would be one of them. And so maybe you're listening to a new teacher, you find this new book and something just seems off, but you can't pinpoint it. Send it to some of your brothers and sisters. Say, hey, would you listen to this guy? Would you read this lady? Would you tell me what you think? Or maybe you're like, man, I just got saved. I don't know who to listen to. I don't know how to test the spirits. I barely even know what I believe about Christianity. Well, I would say one of our D groups would be so vital for you to grow in your faith and to be taught by an older brother or sister in the faith how to follow and know Jesus. But I also say, man, email me. I'll send you pastors. I'll send you books. I'll answer your questions. My email is just jackson at calvarelli.com. Super easy. Send me an email. That's what we're here for, to strengthen each other, protect each other, watch out over each other. That is what the church is here for. And so I want to end. Uh, maybe you, you wouldn't guess that we would end this way, but I just want to end with a call to evangelism. Because is it not a topic like this that should encourage Christians in the act of evangelism because when we choose to not share our faith when we choose to kind of I'm gonna just let my life speak and and gotta do the rest I'm not gonna share it with words when we do that the enemy is actively sharing his message he's actively sending his false teachers to disrupt dismay and to lead people astray And so for us, when we choose not to share the gospel, we allow the kingdom of darkness to grow its hold in our culture while we have the good news, but we keep it inside. 
We keep it bottled up. We have the message of life, but yet we just kind of sit back and we let the enemy have his way in our culture. I was walking around uh, downtown Fuquay the other day and I was pushing my son in the stroller and we, we turned the corner and there's two Jehovah Witnesses with their uh, little stack of, of information and Bibles and booklets ready to evangelize, ready to lead people astray, whether they realize they're doing that or not. Or, or lately more in our area, I've seen more and more Mormon missionaries on their bikes and in their cars traveling around. With, with great zeal and determination, sharing what they think is the gospel, deceiving people. And so for us as Christians, those with the truth, we must share the gospel message. Anytime the gospel is shared and someone comes to faith in Jesus, the, the hold or the grip of darkness in our world gets smaller and smaller and smaller because that's one more person that's in the world with the Holy Spirit. And so you and I as Christians have the gift, the ability, the privilege, and the calling to push back against darkness. Because we'll be the first ones to go to social media, first ones to go to Facebook, first ones to complain, oh man, our culture, so bad, so evil, it's just falling away. But then we won't go out and share the gospel. We won't evangelize our workplace. We won't uh, catechize our, our kids and lead them in the way. Look at all these false religions. We look at Islam and they're growing rapidly because Islam's discipling its kids in their way. But we don't do that. Except my beautiful parents that were on the stage today, right? We'll let our kids go to sports all the time or, or skip out on church. We'll just be like, well, I just want them to figure it out on their own. I don't really want to preach to them too much. I, I get that. But if we don't lead our children in the truth, in the gospel, who will? You can't trust me or, or another staff member or a small group leader to do it. It is our job to evangelize our families, our workplaces, our neighborhoods, our cities. And so I would just encourage you with the great truth that he who is in you is greater than the one in the world. So the power that the false prophets operate from compares not to what you have inside of you through the Holy Spirit. So would we, as the collective body, go out and share the gospel? Go out and live on mission. Our church statement, together we declare the gospel. That's it, right? I got it a little wrong, right? Mass, okay. You guys get it. You guys get it. I'm just the youth pastor. Just the youth pastor. Let us do that as the body. And so maybe in our time of worship, as we, as we enter into that, maybe someone's on your mind. Someone who's lost, someone who doesn't believe the truth. Maybe you just overcome with the, the weight of spiritual lostness. Would you seek the Lord? Would you seek others? Seek his face, ask him for strength, for courage, for boldness to share the gospel. So I'm gonna pray, then we're gonna sing, and uh, Pastor David's gonna have some, some final words for us this morning. So let's, let's seek the Father.